Hello everyone, welcome to episode number five of the Car Flip Show. Today we're gonna to be looking at a few different things. Um, a couple questions and then a little bit about my background and flipping in general, how I became interested in the topic and how I progressed up until now. So we're not gonna do my whole life story, just a little bit about how I became interested in flipping. Um, but the questions we have today, one is about titles. Um, how do you know if a vehicle has a lien on it? Um, is there a way to tell before you buy? And the second question um, is similar, except not with titles. It's about how do you know um, how much a repair will cost on a car, or should you even know before buying how much it's gonna cost to fix certain things that you know are wrong with the car. Um, so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Let's get into the show. And we're gonna start out first with a little bit about me and how I became interested in flipping in general. And it all started for me when I was, I had to have been seven or eight years old, maybe nine. Um, I was with my grandmother one day at a flea market. Um, every Wednesday, I went with my grandma to this flea market during the summer because she kept us there in the summer. Um, so we're there, it's this really tiny flea market in between two really small towns. I grew up in a town called Grifton, North Carolina. We had one stoplight, there wasn't a lot going on there. One of those towns where you kind of know everybody. And there was a town up the road called Aden, North Carolina. And this, I mean, this was the big city to me because they had a Hardee's and a, um, a Burger King. So Hardee's and a Burger King, and they both had play places. So that was, you know, that was the big city. But this flea market was right in the middle. Um, so we would go there every Wednesday, real tiny place. Um, my grandma liked to rummage through all this stuff. Um, there was a vacuum man there. She always needed work done to her vacuum, seemed like, for whatever reason. So we we're always there, just kind of looking around. But I was on the third row, and there was three short rows. And on the third row, I knew there was a spot that I liked. The guy usually had electronics. And so I would always look forward to get to the third row. And I just got, I think it was for Christmas, I just got a Sega Genesis. And so I only had a couple games and I hadn't been able to buy any new ones. My parents hadn't gotten any new ones. I think I had Sonic the Hedgehog 2, which I actually made it to the last level like three times, but I lost every time. And you can't, and it, like with a Sega, you couldn't save your games back then. So I just got frustrated and I hadn't played it in a long time. And then I had like a Mortal Kombat or something. Um, but I was there and I spotted the Sega Genesis and there was like seven or eight games, a lot of ones that I thought would you know, be fun to play. And so I walked up and I asked the guy how much it was and I think he said like 20 bucks or something. And so all I had with me was like 10 or 15, I don't remember exactly, but I remember I offered less than he was asking. And when he said yes, I was amazed, like you can really do that. And so he you know, gives me this big box of stuff, there's cords and controllers all hanging out of it. And I'm walking through the flea market, proud as I can be that I talked this guy down and I got what I wanted for less than he was asking. And as I'm walking, this guy walks up to me and says, hey kid, where'd you get the Sega? And I told him, you know, the guy in the back has electronics. And he said, did they have any more? And I said, no. And he said, well, would you sell yours? And so I said, well, oh, okay. But the thing was, I, I wanted the games though. I didn't wanna, you know, give up the games because that's what I bought it for. So I said, you know, there's some games that I want but I'll sell the rest of it. And he said, how much? And I said, well, how much would you give me? And he offered me whatever the number was, it was double what I had paid, plus I got to keep the games. Um, so I think it may have been 30 bucks. I paid 15, he offered me 30. So I give him the box with all the cords and the cables because I didn't need that anyway. And he got the console and I got to keep five or six of the games. And so I doubled my money, plus got these games for free. Um, and so I thought I was like the biggest, baddest businessman on earth. I'm like this eight, nine year old walking around with my chest poked out, holding my games. I couldn't wait to find my grandma. When my granddad got home later that day, I told him. My mom picked me up that afternoon. I'm telling her on the way home. I told my dad about it. This was this big thing for me that I had, um, you know, beat the system. I had, you know, conquered the flea market that day. Um, and of course, I enjoyed my Sega games. And the 15 bucks was nice. But for me, it really sparked something inside of me. Um, that made me realize that there was more to um, there was more to transactions than just what you saw. I guess face value, what you saw at face value. You're in the grocery store. The sign says a dollar ninety nine. You pay a dollar ninety nine. But that wasn't always true in life. You could offer people less than they were asking. Now that's not going to work in the grocery store. But in general, you could offer people less what they were asking. And for me, this helped later on because I went on eventually to buy and sell electronics on eBay and Amazon. And as a teenager, I would go to flea markets. Uh, we moved closer to the Charlotte, North Carolina area, so we had bigger flea markets, you know, bigger and better flea markets. So I would go, I'd buy electronics, um, cameras, you know, portable DVD players, and I would sell them on eBay, which it was a little less crowded than it is today, people-wise. So you could actually get a little more for your stuff back then. 
and there was a little more interest because the internet was, or that phase of the internet was new. And so I made a good bit of money just through high school buying and selling things up there. Um, and eventually, and I transitioned into cars. My dad had always bought and sold cars, and I actually had access to a dealer auction that I got to use as a teenager. And so between the auction and buying cars from individuals, I got to make, you know, for the age that I was, I was making really good money buying and selling. But it all went back to that first realization of, okay, this is how the world actually works. It doesn't have to be this cookie cutter thing that people do. It, it can be something else. And a lot of people have to go through the process one time to understand that. A lot of people that I've helped begin to flip cars, um, once they go through it the first time, a lot of times they make money, but even if they don't, they begin to understand how it works and to know that it can work for them is a really big um, milestone moment to understand that, okay, like it's not just something other people can do, I can actually do it myself. And for me, I learned that lesson as an eight, nine year old at the flea market buying and selling a Sega Genesis. So that's, that, that's my story in a nutshell on how I learned to flip things in general. You know, a lot of people flip different things. Uh, there's a lot of people that do still buy and sell electronics on the internet. There's a guy that I heard of recently that makes six figures buying cameras, digital cameras in bulk, and then reselling them on eBay. People do it with phones, electronics. Um, there's a place called govdeals.com, G-O-V-D-E-A-L-S. They sell all kinds of things, but there's a tab up there there's a recovered items tab, and occasionally there's uh, musical equipment or Apple products or you know all kinds of random things that you'll see up there. People are buying these $10,000 lots, but in those lots, there was an Apple one I was watching recently, and there was like three iMacs, two iPads, um, the new big iPad Pros. There was uh, multiple iPhone 7s. There were several iPhone 6s. I mean, just the list went on and on and on, and it went for 10,000, but there was easily seventeen eighteen thousand dollars worth of merchandise in there now obviously you're taking a risk in buying that and then resell you're, you're hoping that you're going to sell it but for products like that it's hard not to sell an apple product and all these things were new in the box sealed i don't exactly know how they ended up on this government site but people are making money in a lot of different areas and for me it just happens to be cars and if you're watching this video obviously there is some interest um, in this field but know that you can do it there's people doing it right now. Um, I'm literally in my office at a car dealership that I started because I learned how to do it one car at a time. And one car went to two cars and three cars. And then I had seven and eight cars in my driveway. And my wife didn't exactly like that. So I transitioned from that to here. And so if I can do it, you can do it. And not only that, you're gonna see people in the comments. You're gonna see people on our Facebook group, which if you're not in our Facebook group, um, if you'll go to thecarflip.com, if you'll subscribe to the blog, there's a spot to put your email address in there. You'll get an email from me inviting you to join that Facebook group. Really awesome group, a lot of really involved people that are basically talking about exactly what I'm talking about, the daily grind of flipping cars. Um, there's people doing it right now. You can too. All right, so let's get into our first question. The first question is from Mike Johnson. He actually posted this on our last episode, and his question was about titles. And I think specifically it involved how to know if there was a lien on a vehicle before you purchase it. Um, this happened to actually my dad one time. He bought a BMW Z3 and he bought it from a guy that basically said something to the effect of, I can get you the title, I just have to go pick it up from here. And my dad gave, it was a really good deal. I mean, it was like $1,500 and this is when a Z3 was worth seven or $8,000. Problem was the guy owed $3,000 on it, or three or four, it, it, was, it was a lot of money the guy owed on it. Um, my dad ended up getting stuck, had to give the car back, not to the guy, but to the bank that it was financed with. Um, the lesson learned there for my, my dad at the time was don't buy a vehicle unless you have the title in front of you or unless you are at the bank. Um, there are other ways of doing transactions when there's not a title, but you never want to give money to somebody blindly and they kind of you know walk off into the night and disappear. Um, but an easy way to know if there is a lien on a vehicle is to look at the title. And I've got a few of them actually here I'm going to show you. Um, one is from North Carolina, and this is actually where I live, so I'm most familiar with this title. But most titles are going to have a spot for brands, and this doesn't involve your um, liens, but if it's a salvage vehicle or reconstructed anything, you're going to see that in this box here, at least in North Carolina you will. But there's another spot, if there was a lien on this vehicle, it would be in this box here, if I can get this in the camera. This says first lien holder. That would be the name of the bank or whoever the lien is through. And then you'd have a date of that lien. Now if there were 
if there was information here, for the person to physically have this title, it would have to have been released by the bank. And so there would be a signature here from someone at the bank, their title, and the date. Um, a bank, when they do a, lien, uh, a loan on a car, you have to give them the title and then they give you the money. Um, so for someone to have the title like this, there generally cannot be a lien on it because they have the title. Um, here's another one from Virginia. Now Virginia's title is a little different. Um, in Virginia, you actually sign over and can do writing on the front when you're reassigning the title. In North Carolina, there are no places like that on the front. If I can hold it up, um, everything is done on the back of the title right here. But this one being from Virginia, they actually have a spot on theirs that says no liens. So if there's not a lien on it, in Virginia you'll have a little notation that says no liens. And then finally, I've got a Georgia title. Now this is one that has had a lien. And they've got a box here that says first lien or security interest, which is gonna be your lien holder. It's got their information there, which is Navy Federal Credit Union. Now, if the person had this title, that would generally mean they've paid it off because they have it and the bank doesn't. But we've got a release signature here. We've got the date there. So this is a completely legit title because it's been released by the bank. And uh, Mike, I hope that helps maybe clear that up. Um, if it was a loan that was done through a title loan type business, like you mentioned in your question, generally the title loan company is gonna have that title. If you wanna buy that vehicle, you could go with that person to the title loan office and pay the vehicle off to the title loan company in which they would send you the title. You can have a note put there to send you the title instead of the person who the loan is with. Um, the same with the bank. If I, I've went several times with people to their bank, paid off their vehicle, and then had the title sent to me. So there's, a, there's ways around that not having that title, but generally if someone has the title in hand, there's not gonna be a lien because they've got the title and the bank doesn't. So I hope that helps Mike and everyone else. Um, our second question was from Ruben2087. This is also on YouTube. Um, I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, when purchasing a vehicle, do you keep or research ahead of time how much the cost of missing or broken parts are? Also, have you ever come across a deal you had to back out of because the seller wasn't so honest in the ad or posting? We'll start out with the first question there. Um, and the short answer is yes, almost always. If I know a vehicle has a problem ahead of time, I'm gonna research how much it costs to fix it. And actually, I actually have this laying on my desk currently. This has nothing to do with cars, but this is a, let's see, what is this? This is a power supply board for a Apple iMac. I've got a big 27 inch Apple iMac. Recently started making a weird buzzing sound on the inside. Um, I noticed it was associated with raising the brightness up and down, and then it actually started cutting off and wouldn't turn back on. Um, so, did a little research, did some Googling, those symptoms matched up with this. So I went to the Apple store and asked them, um, they actually said the same thing, it's most likely your power supply. Um, they told me how much it might cost. So I went home and of course Googled power supply. I found a video of a girl that was basically doing the exact same job. It took her like seven minutes. She showed every single spot that there was a screw. She showed how to take off the big glass panel on the front. You had to remove the whole LCD. It's an all-in-one type thing. So you had to remove the whole LCD. You had to pull four screws, unplug two plugs, one here, one here. Um, this was only 46 bucks on eBay. So Apple would have been, I don't know, there's no telling, they would have been expensive. Um, but I did it for 46 dollars and 30 minutes of my time. And actually, I'm not supposed to be touching the back of this because I just did this the other day and they said it can hold power in there and could shock you, so don't touch the metal. Um, which would make for a really great video, but I would not enjoy it. So, um, But this is the exact same process that I'm doing when I'm looking at, say, a Ford Taurus that needs an alternator. I'm gonna Google Ford Taurus alternator replacement. You're gonna come up with probably 12 and probably more YouTube videos of people replacing the alternator. You're gonna see people that said, this job takes two hours, or this job is really difficult, or it's really easy. Actually, most Ford Tauruses, it's a really easy job because it's right on top. And then you could go to advancedautoparts.com. You could type in your vehicle information. So let's say 2002 Ford Taurus, put in your engine, 3.0. Is it the overhead valve or the double overhead cam? Um, so you'd select your engine. Then you would see a price. So I'm just 
making this up. They're probably, I don't know, 167, 170 bucks. Um, then you could reference from there, you could go to eBay, put in the same information. Theirs might be $67. It's usually a lot cheaper on eBay. Um, then you could go from eBay to car-park.com and find out that an alternator is probably only about $35 to $50 from a junkyard. So then you can evaluate which alternator you want to use. For me, on a car like that, I'm usually going with the cheapest option and the one I can get a hold of the quickest, which is probably going to be from carpart.com. So go pick up your alternator. You know how to install it because you've watched the YouTube video of someone already doing it. And that's pretty much the process you're going to duplicate over and over and over again. Now I pay for a system that I use that gives me detailed instructions on every single repair that you could possibly do to a car. Um, which is it's called all data and for me having a dealership we do a lot of repairs it's like 200 250 dollars a month um, but for most people you can get anything you need just by going to youtube so i hope that answers your question on that part now let's get to the other part of your question have you ever come across a seller that wasn't honest in the ad or posting and that's a very unfortunately common thing that doesn't happen all the time but there are several times that i've gone to look at a car i do a lot of jeep wranglers so you get there and the car look great you get underneath and it's rusted like beyond repair it's a really common thing with the wranglers you want to be on the lookout for that there's other cars that you go to look at and there's a check engine light the person didn't mention i had this on a bmw not long ago it was a 04 7 series and it had a it had like seven or eight check engine light codes that were in the system and i took my you know my scanner with me that's a common thing that i do um, and you know, he was like, oh, you know, yeah, I meant to tell you, but, and if they were simple fixes, a lot of people will say, yeah, it's just a $50 sensor. And if it was a $50 sensor, they probably would have already done that. Um, now sometimes that's the case, but in this case, being it was a BMW, I backed off and didn't want to mess with it because I was already paying and thought he was asking a little more than I wanted, but it was a nice car and I thought had, and there was room to make money on it, but it wasn't worth my time and trouble with the seven or eight codes that were in there. Um, because BMWs are just known to be expensive on those type of repairs. So yes, I've backed out of several because of those type of things. That's an area that you don't want to get too emotionally involved with a person to where you get there and you feel like they're expecting you to buy it. And so you don't want to make the person feel bad, but you got to watch out for yourself um, as opposed to watching out for the other person. Um, if they're not being honest with me, that's a big um, red flag for me. And uh, I have bought cars from people that were being dishonest with me because they didn't realize that it actually was a simple problem. They were trying to hide something from me, but it wasn't a big deal. But if someone's trying to hide something, red flag, look out for other problems on the vehicle because if they're willing to you know, mislead you in one area, there's probably something else they haven't been truthful in as well. So be mindful of that. Hopefully that helps you out, Ruben. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode of The Car Flip Show. Now, you're probably noticing that my shirt and hat have magically changed colors and the lighting is probably horrible right now. Um, I'm actually recording this a week after I recorded the first one, which I believe I was wearing blue and gray. Um, we had a problem with the file at the end of that recording, so we had to re-record. So it's not magic, it's just a problem with technology. Um, speaking of technology, we would love, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to be subscribed to our channel. And somewhere down here, if you're watching on YouTube, on this bottom below, our video, there'll be a button you can subscribe. We would love for you to see these videos before anyone else by subscribing there. Also, I'm gonna put the name of my Instagram handle up here. It's gonna be The Car Flip. So if you go to Instagram, look me up at The Car Flip. I would love to connect with you there. Other than that, I'm gonna put a link over here to thecarflip.com. If you have not been to the website and put your email in the top, um, you know, other than receiving emails from me occasionally, you're gonna be sent a link to a free Facebook group where there's over, I believe there's over 1,500 people now, um, just like you, maybe that are just starting out or maybe more experienced people that you can pick their brains, you can ask questions in the group. I'm there interacting, I post live videos every now and then of what I'm up to. So we would love to have you as a part of that community. Simply go to thecarflip.com, there's a bar at the top, you put your email address in, you'll get an email from me with a link inviting you to join that Facebook page, you simply click click join the page and uh, you'll be a member there. It's completely free and there's a lot of really good resources there, a lot of really good people that know what they're doing that you can pick their brains anytime you want. So we would love to have you part of that Facebook community. Otherwise, we're on to episode six. Um, we're really excited about some things that are coming up in this new year. One thing that is coming um, over the horizon is a course. We've got a, a course, um, I don't know if the official name has been decided on yet, but it's gonna be something like The Car Flip Academy. Um, for people that 
basically don't know anything about flipping cars, we're gonna take them from where you are to where you wanna to be to flip your first car and beyond. Also, we are considering starting a podcast with some of the same content, but in more of an audio, in your headphones kind of a feel, so you can listen while you're at the gym or on the road, that type of thing. So if that's something you're interested in, I would love to hear from you. Send me an email or comment below if that's something you think would be awesome because that's in the, in the works, hopefully. Um, otherwise, we'll see you in episode six.